Um, I'm delighted to be here today to tell you a little about the history of the North Carolina Museum of Art and particular about this critical period between 1947 and 1960 when the museum came together and in a physical way um, and uh, institutionally speaking. So just have to, okay, there we go. Um, before I uh, tell you about the specific events, I want to say that um, really to help understand the context in which many of the museums um, in the south of the United States were founded um, and, and the major ones, Virginia uh, Museum of Fine Arts, the Mint Museum in Charlotte, the High Museum. Uh, these museums were all founded in the early 20th century. Also the Ringling Museum and the uh, Museum in Greenville, South Carolina, the, the uh, Bob Jones University Art Museum. And North Carolina, as we uh, most of us know, was largely an agricultural state until the 20th century. And the, uh, there was not a museum in the state in the 1920s. And uh, this was really getting, um, making the citizens of the state feel that they, they needed to, to be able to have a fine arts, a museum dedicated to uh, the appreciation of art. And they were somewhat inspired by the critic H.L. Uh, Mencken, who famously wrote a, a essay uh, titled The Sahara of the Beaux-Arts in 1917. And he pretty much dismissed all cultural achievement below the Potomac. Uh, his letter is, he was a, a very um, acerbic and also quite um, witty uh, essayist and satirist. And he commented on the social scene, literature, music, politicians, contemporary movements, and he did not mince words. So he says um, in one um, uh, paragraph, not a single picture gallery worth going into or a single orchestra capable of playing the nine symphonies of Beethoven or a single opera house or a single theater devoted to decent plays you will not find a single Southern prose writer who can actually write. It harsh indeed. This was, uh, I know that this was uh, always in the minds of the founders of the art museum and also in, in, gener in the uh, minds of the um, press because throughout the 1950s when the museum after the museum had opened in April 1956, which I'll get to in a moment, um, all many editorials reference Mencken and um, they are trying to, um, they really want to show, look what we've done. Uh, this is no longer a um, desert. And he, you know, he'd be, who would be laughing now? So, uh, this is around the same time. This shows a downtown Raleigh. Uh, you see the Capitol at the center. And I love to look at this photograph because the early history of the North Carolina Museum of Art revolved around Capitol Square. And I'm going to be taking you to, um, this is where the first a brick and mortar location of the North Carolina Museum of Art was located. It is uh, 107 East Morgan Street. So you've got Morgan Street at, um, right here, Fayetteville Street, and Salisbury over here, and Edenton over here. Um, so in 1924, 
12 members of North Carolina State Literary and Historical Association formed a sister organization whose purpose was to foster an appreciation for art and design throughout the state. The founders were some members of the North Carolina Historical Association and they styled themselves the North Carolina State Art Society. And they articulated two chief objectives. The first was to establish an art museum for the people of North Carolina and integrate art into the state schools. And then the second was to found an art museum. The chief, the two, I, I show this photograph, which was taken in 1926. And um, the woman who really carried this project was Catherine Pendleton Arrington of Warrington, North Carolina, a great, strong woman who led the whole uh, mission for 30 years. Uh, and this unfolded in uh, the first look location of this project, which was just uh, a series, they initially um, uh, annual exhibitions and lectures. This took place in the Sir Walter Hotel down, which is still um, standing on Fayetteville Street, and it's about to be turned into condominiums. But um, you all might know that it is, also was uh, during uh, the 20s, 30s, 40s, um, and 50s was considered uh, like a uh, unofficial um, house of government because so many uh, meetings took place there. And, um, and of course, conversations behind the scenes. And uh, the group received a, um, they attracted their first benefactor in 1927, Robert F. Pfeiffer of Concord who bequeathed a collection of paintings and prints along with funds and trust. This gift sparked further donations and the creation of a temporary state art museum in 1929, which was housed in the agriculture building that had just um, been built in 1921 to 23. Uh, also uh, the great building that is still um, standing fortunately. Um, but they needed a permanent space. They considered creating uh, or establishing the museum in the Duncan Cameron home on Hillsborough Street. This was a beautiful antebellum mansion that was demolished um, in 1938. So uh, unfortunately that plan um, did not come to fruition, but a few years later in 1939, they were allotted, this group of uh, the North Carolina State Art Society was allotted two rooms in the uh, old Supreme Court building. This is on Morgan and Fayetteville and Salisbury. Uh, and uh, this was also known as the library building. And so this was a place where they would hold exhibitions and also display some of the art that they had received. Um, and uh, then uh, depression, uh, well, this is right um, in the middle of the depression, 1939. Uh, fortunately, right around the time they move into the building on the old, in the old Supreme Court building, they receive a lifeline from the Works Progress Administration, uh, uh, the New Deal arm um, of uh, Roosevelt's administration. And this, the Works Progress Administration decided to establish art galleries and community centers across the United States. And they decided to make Raleigh their first one. And so between 1939 and 1943, the, the State Art Gallery, uh, as it was known, and the um, organizers worked hand in hand and they developed a partnership and they would receive exhibitions from Washington, DC, and then um, had funding to uh, host uh, lectures 
and bring school children in. So it was a very important period and um, a, a particularly progressive uh, chapter in the North Carolina Museum of Arts history because they were reaching out to, especially to children in segregated schools in Raleigh, so in uh, Southeast Raleigh. And uh, 19, the war um, comes and goes. Uh, North Carolina was um, deeply involved in terms of sending troops to that war. And money um, was during that uh, period, no, the government, uh, the treasury was not spending money on the kinds of projects that the government would be spending money on um, typically. All the building projects came to a halt, and so uh, money built up in the in the uh, treasury coffers. And in around 1945, the legislators decided they needed to spend this money, figure out how they were going to spend the surplus. Uh, this is uh, a night. We're talking about a million dollar surplus, and. Numerous groups were vying for it, but the, the North Carolina State Art Society made a plea through, and they had a new uh, leader come in, uh, a man who had moved from, to North Carolina in 1940, joined the North Carolina State Art Society. And in 1947, he and the group decide to, to write a bill uh, that, would, that would make an appropriation to the art society that would enable them to purchase an art collection. And this man is Robert L. Humber. He was a legislator uh, beginning, I think, in 1958. He was on the state legislature. But before this, he was just a, a very vocal, a, a funny man, um, a gregarious, charismatic, and he lobbied the legislature to write this bill. So the, um, the group was ambitious. They decided they would ask for a, a million dollars, and that was uh, equivalent to about uh, $12 million today. So the Humber and um, approaches some lawmakers, including a, a man named John Kerr. And um, in 1947, the bill comes up at the very end of the session, um, the legislative session, and it actually passes by a margin of 50 to 43. It was big news and it was very controversial. But the idea is, uh, um, th first of all, the, 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 the State Art Society and its fledgling museum was, did not have a, a, it's a space of its own. It did not have any real estate um, and there was nowhere to store art or, and um, also they needed a fireproof building that was a veritable museum, uh, mu museum type of building that would adhere to various requirements for art. So they were still uh, working out of two rooms in the old Supreme Court building. They needed a building and they needed a, a collection. They had received a few donations that were very important, but they, wanted uh, uh, to create a collection ex novo. They wanted to just um, come, come out with a bang. And so this million dollar appropriation would provide them with the funds to acquire art. The legislators, um, when they debated this bill, um, the, the, the reason that the idea took hold was that Robert L. Humber told that the group um, that or he uh, approached some potential outside donors before the legislation came up for discussion. And he approached a man named Samuel H. Kress. 
who was the five and dime store magnet who made his fortune uh, in the early 19th century from the highly profitable uh, SH Press and Company variety stores. And I really wish I could see my audience because I, I, um, I know I have to, to explain what the Crest stores were to um, certain audiences, but many of you may also be familiar with them. So I apologize if I'm telling you things you know. But the, uh, this idea was Samuel H. Press was the biggest, uh, along with Mellon, um, and he was the, the biggest uh, art philanthropist in the country at the time. He had given a huge gift in 1941 to the National Gallery of Art, and um, right when it opened. And so Robert L. Humber, he met, he went to call on Cress in New York and the, in the mid-1940s, and the two of them apparently worked out an agreement, and Cress, uh, he said, why don't you donate a million dollars to the, the North Carolina uh, Planned Art Museum, it did not have a name at that point, but uh, he apparently uh, he was led to believe that, that Cress this uh, major, very, very wealthy man living in New York who had no heirs, he was led to believe that Cress would, would donate a million dollars cash. Okay, so um, the, the bill is passed with the idea that there's going to be a million dollars coming from a private donor. And the, the, the deal that, that Humber had worked out with, with Samuel Crest was that he was not to reveal the name of the donor. So um, it's funny because the newspaper accounts, um, it, reading the story of the passage of the bill, uh, apparently uh, the, the legislators were an, under the understanding that a rich man from the North would be donating a million dollars to this project. And so with that um, idea, they passed this bill. And then uh, the, the group, the State Art Society, had to figure out how they would actually make this, this gift come to fruition. Uh, Humber went back to Cress and uh, asked him to um, if he would be uh, making this gift and when. And Cress said, Press was actually ill at that point. Press's foundation, the Samuel H. Press Foundation, did not have any record of this, this um, promise. And they uh, ended up uh, saying, uh, we don't know what you're talking about. Um, it was a quite a shock to the people um, who were hoping that they would be have, have a million dollars in hand at the end of 1949. But within um, a, a few, uh, it took about three years, but Humber convinced the Samuel H. Cress Foundation to donate a uh, million dollars in art. And so the, the Cress Foundation was in the process of giving out um, the remainder of Cress's collection that had not been given to the National Gallery. So they agreed that they would, they would give a, a collection of mostly Italian Renaissance paintings to the North Carolina Museum of Art, assuming that it could get, um, if it, assuming that it could obtain a building that was safe, uh, a safe and fireproof building in which to house uh, the collection. Uh, I like to to give a sense of this million dollars um, because it, it's meaningless unless we know the um, value today. I mentioned it's about twelve million dollars uh, today, but um, the uh, incomes in 1947, the average income for all industries was twenty six hundred dollars a um, twenty six hundred dollars a year which is about 31,000 today. Uh, government workers, um, that was the average salary for government workers. 
uh, it was rare to have a, um, a significantly higher salary, but Joe DiMaggio made $90,000 in uh, 1947. But the, the director of the North Carolina Museum, who was appointed in 1955, he earned $10,000 a year. So um, it was a large sum that they received. Now, in 1951, they still, uh, it was still just uh, plans were being made to uh, acquire a collection, but um, they did, this group received new accommodations in the education building. In, at the, um, in the fall of 1951. This building was uh, begun in 1938 and finished in um, a year. We know this building, of course, because it's on Edenton Street. It's a beautiful Art Deco building uh, inside and out. But, um, but the Art Society established a state art gallery in that building in 1951. So I, 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 uh, it's always good, I need to be reminded that the museum didn't just come out of, um, out of thin air in, when it opened in 1956. That it, there were, it was a very long effort to, um, to establish this institution. So 1947 um, to 1951, there's this push to, or a really quite frenzied effort to uh, get the Cress people to make good on the donation. Um, and once Cress decides that he, the Cress Foundation uh, offers to give a million dollars in art, the Art Society has to bring this uh, this proposal back to the General Assembly um, because the, the bill that was written in 1947 specified that it must be a cash gift. So um, the lawmakers write another uh, law and um, the, the law gives the State Art Society, the founders, uh, the authority to accept the million dollars in art. This was a very, very smart move on the part of the state. And you'll see why um, in, in a moment. And if you're familiar with our collection, you will know um, that we have a really fantastic collection of um, early uh, Italian and Baroque and um, other European um, from the early modern period art. The governor appoints a state art commission. Uh, once this, this idea is um, now um, a, a reality of acquiring collection. And so the governor appoints a five member commission drawn from the membership of the state art society that will be in charge of spending the million dollars. Um, I show on the right a photograph that was taken in 1949 of the board of directors um, of the North Carolina State Art Society. And um, the, this man right here is Robert L. Humber, whom I mentioned earlier. Um, also another important founder was Clarence Poe, the editor of Progressive Farmer Magazine, um, who, um, was played such a, a important role in early um, cultural history of our state. And, um, and as well as Catherine Pendleton Arrington, this woman here. So um, many important people that were dedicated um, and dedicated all of their time to um, making, it, making it possible for the state to have an art collection and um, a museum that would be open to all North Carolinians. The uh, commission that was formed was, um, it, it uh, had, four members from the State Art Society, and then one art historian, um, also on the Art Society, um, but he was uh, a professor at UNC Chapel Hill, and um, he was a, a, a critical member of this group who was going to go up to New York and look at art, uh, because he was the only art historian. Um, 
So the group also decides to hire a consultant and they hired an art dealer named Carl Hamilton. Uh, he is a New York art dealer who was um, very experienced, uh, extremely shrewd. He was actually um, a, a dealer in the 1950s quoted was quoted saying that he was smart as a warehouse rat. And uh, so he was not particularly liked, but he knew the, um, he knew the market very well. And these uh, members of the art society needed help. They were going up to New York at a time when there was a, um, numerous dealers and um, just a wealth of paintings and sculptures for sale um, in the wake of the Second World War. So the other um, specification that the legislators made was that um, dominant emphasis shall be placed upon the acquisition of masterpieces of the American, British, French, Spanish, Flemish, and Dutch schools. And um, the, the group, the Art Society, had already obtained a large collection of mostly American paintings from Robert F. Pfeiffer in 1928. And so they decided they needed to um, acquire mostly European art and, um, and actually all European. Well, except for um, they did reserve funds for American um, and they went up to New York, um, they started looking at art and um, they were also told that they needed to have the collection vetted by the director or chief curator of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. And, and that's what the lawmakers specified. They didn't want these, um, these really um, lay people to go and, um, acquire works that, that would not be, you know, considered, that wouldn't hold their value. And so um, the, the uh, in 1951, um, it, throughout the year, the Art Commission, the State Art Commission uh, spent um, a, a lot of time uh, looking at um, art in the various galleries in New York, and they selected 200 paintings and uh, actually um, uh, almost 200 paintings, um, maybe um, a handful of sculptures, but they felt that the painting, they needed to have a picture gallery, um, much like these um, estates, the, the great collections um, in England uh, that were formed in the 19th century. Uh, they envisioned having um, rooms full of paintings on the wall. And um, by the way, they were, they knew that they needed to be acquiring works by modern and contemporary artists, but they decided to seize upon the favorable uh, market um, for old masters. So that was um, another motivating factor for going, the selections that they ended up making. But um, when they had this list picked out, they approached the National Gallery and the director said, I, we're not going to do that for you. Um, that is really um, a conflict of interest for us. And um, I, we just don't think that we can appraise the, the collection that you've picked out for the state of North Carolina. So um, the um, Carl Hamilton, the dealer who was um, advising the Art Commission, he took um, two notebooks full of ectochromes, um, large slides, and um, he went out to California and he called upon a man who was a, the, one of the most distinguished art professionals in the United States um, and in the world. He had been director of the Detroit Institute of Arts from 1924 to 44. Uh, when he retired, he moved to Los Angeles and he um, started advising the Los Angeles County Museum and eventually became its director. 
And then um, in the early 1950s, J. Paul Getty uh, approached Valentiner and wanted help putting together um, a museum in Malibu. So he was uh, also a very accomplished art historian uh, and scholar. Um, he was a Rembrandt scholar and uh, also a, a specialist in uh, 14th century Italian sculpture, but his, his interests were incredibly broad and um, he had a really uh, exceptionally good eye. So um, Hamilton shows up on his doorstep the day after Christmas in 1951 and um, asks this man, um, would you please approve uh, a collection of art for the um, planned art museum for the state of North Carolina. Valentiner had never met this man. Uh, he was very surprised, and um, but he agreed to do this. And so he approved 157 of 174 paintings that had been picked out. Um, and uh, then the Hamilton and the State Art Commission um, come back to the legislature and, and uh, and show what they've picked out. Um, they have assembled a very uh, panoramic collection, but the legislature does not um, feel comfortable um, going against the, the uh, requirement of the law that was written in 1951, requiring the National uh, Gallery of Art to vet their purchases. So, um, they um, had to actually um, raise a, um, uh, they had to settle this, this dispute over um, whether Valentiner's approval could comply. And that was worked out in the courts. Um, and the uh, Robert L. Um, McMillan, uh, he was involved, his father was involved in that court case, by the way. Um, he's a nonagenarian in Raleigh, and many of you probably know him. Uh, and and um, it was uh, uh, really the fate of the institution was hanging in the balance in 1951. And, um, but, but in the end, the treasury uh, and the state auditor released the money and um, the purchases were made. And then uh, as um, luck would have it in 1953, the Pfeiffer Trust, um, which had been um, the group had received uh, an interest in back in 1928, um, that fund um, ends up distributing $300,000 to the North Carolina State Art Society. And so they go and purchase um, a, another um, a group of uh, artworks. They purchase an additional 31 paintings for a total of 201 paintings. And the assembled collection provides a survey of European and American painting from 1420 to 1900. There is, as I mentioned, they did not collect modern art. And um, the, 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 the state auditor was apparently uh, very opposed to modern art. And um, so they uh, were, not only did they feel that they needed to take advantage of the, the great um, prices for old masters, but they also um, really were, persuaded to eschew modern art. So, um, however, they did purchase one lone modern painting and um, it is a painting that is um, a, a really great painting that we have hanging in the galleries today. And the collection, um, the, the way that they distributed the funds is they ended up spending over half of the funds on Dutch and Flemish art. And um, this was the most expensive art that they bought um, because they bought a number of Rubenses. I'll return to that in a minute. But um, 
once they had acquired this collection of 200 paintings and um, two sculptures, they didn't have a, a building yet, so they had to place all of this um, art in storage. And they did this, um, they placed the art in storage in uh, warehouses in New York. Um, and by the way, these, uh, the haze, this is um, something I always um, really liked um, finding out was that they placed this art in storage with Circa Haze which is a company that is still extant and, um, and another company, Day and Meyer, Murray and Young. And these are um, art storage uh, in, uh, facilities in New York that are still used today. Um, 1952, they have a collection, they don't have a building, but um, they, just, they, they are um, at last able to, to claim a, uh, the rights to name this museum and they decide to, to name it the North Carolina Museum of Art. Uh, this is a meeting of the North Carolina State Art Society in December 1952. And this took place in, this is the, uh, the Virginia Dare Ballroom of the Sir Walter Hotel. And also um, they, at around this time um, were finally given some real estate by the um, Buildings and Grounds uh, Administration of the state government. And the, the, they are given an, the old State Highway Commission building. And um, it's this building here that I showed you earlier. Um, this is what it looked like when it was built in 1927, and then a few years later it was renovated into a four-story structure. Uh, it's very ordinary building, but um, it was made possible because the original State Highway Commission, uh, uh, or, or the, the State Highway Commission built a new headquarters for um, the expanded department, and that's the building that is um, that you are familiar with on um, Wilmington Street and um, Morgan. So um, this decommissioned building is going to have to be converted into an art museum. Uh, the uh, construction uh, company is hired and the state appropriates another 200,000 to transform this building. Um, you can see they had a lot of work to do. And the uh, project ends up taking uh, much longer than anticipated. So construction begins in August 1954. Um, it, they run into delays and, um, of course, cost overruns. And it ends up costing um, over, it's $350,000 approximately. Uh, while this is being readied for the display of the collection, the founders, uh, need to hire a director. So they write to Wilhelm Valentiner, the man that, that had vetted their collection back in 1951. And Valentiner had at this point retired to Italy, but uh, Robert L. Humber and Carl Hamilton decided he was the person for this job. Uh, he had moved to this, Valentiner was living in Rome and he was working on a um, revised um, book on uh, Leonardo da Vinci and um, also working on Italian sculpture and really enjoying his life there. But um, he receives a letter and is very tempted to take this position. So he, ex he accepts it. And it is um, really, really the most fortunate thing that uh, happened to this institution um, because he had so many contacts and um, around the world and uh, was uh, because he had great distinction, um, he put the museum on the map. So he moves from Rome to Raleigh, North Carolina. And um, while this construction is still going on in late 1955, he assumes the post and um, in early January, the collection is sent. Um, they, they decide that the building really um, is almost ready, not quite, but almost ready. So the collection is sent from New York 
And here you see it being installed in the Morgan Street building. And um, it was very exciting for the um, everyone in Raleigh. The, all of this, of course, was covered um, minute by minute by the press, which is where all of these photographs come from. Um, it's the News and Observer um, photographers. And I need to shout out to the State Archives for letting me use these. Um, but in this photograph here, um, this is uh, Luther Hodges. This is Edwin Gill. He was a state treasurer and also uh, one of the, um, he was on the State Art Commission and um, other um, uh, uh, officials as well. So they're taking a look at the collection. Um, it's, it's installed in this four-story building and um, People uh, start coming to take a look, but it's not ready yet. And, and throughout the spring, there was um, great anticipation. And, and um, eventually on April 6th, the museum opens. And it was um, a very exciting day for the state and for the citizens um, living in Raleigh. Here you see the building um, after it had been renovated and Luther Hodges is cutting the ribbons. It was um, a, a huge, huge news throughout the state. And it was uh, called, it was called uh, by the newspaper columnist, um, Nell Battle Harris, uh, a miracle on Morgan Street. And um, it really did seem like a miracle because there had been uh, significant um, uh, obstacles to getting this institution off the ground, and um, including the various legis um, legislative acts that were passed, but also there were quite a number of lawsuits. And um, when the collection opened, it was um, very, very impressive. It made um, art news and was um, also made the um, A Life magazine in 1956. Uh, a big story um, was dedicated to this opening. So back to the collection, um, what they ended up acquiring was um, American, Dutch, Flemish, Italian, Spanish, British, French, and German. And here you see the distribution of funds. Uh, and uh, I, I mentioned that the, the most expensive works were Dutch, Flemish, and or German. And so the, the bulk of funds were spent in those areas. Um, so it, um, doesn't mean that they bought more um, art of, from Dutch, um, Flemish, and German cultures, but they, but they uh, thought that they were buying um, a number of Rubenses, and they were very expensive then as they are now. Here are some highlights from that collection. Um, and the most expensive work was a painting uh, by an a artist um, from Cologne uh, working um, in the 1440s, Stefan Lochner. And uh, this is a painting whose attribution has been, been, um, been debated, but um, the, the expert, the latest scholarship suggested is by Lochner, but it's a beautiful, um, very small panel. It looks like a medieval uh, illuminated manuscript illumination. Um, this was $64,350. And um, therefore it was, it was far and above the most expensive work uh, that was acquired. Here you see some other prices. Um, and um, here are the seven Rubenses that the commission bought. Now today, um, most of these are considered to be um, products of Rubens's workshop, um, but uh, that still um, 
I mean, Rubens was, of course, ran a very large um, workshop in Antwerp, and so it was common to have um, assistants. And in any case, it, we ended up with uh, really some great paintings uh, in that uh, group, and uh, which you, you will be familiar with if you are familiar with the collection. Um, the other Flemish paintings, um, some highlights, uh, $435 on these great works, including the um, Sager's Denial of St. Peter, um, a Snyder's Market Stall. Uh, this uh, is an exquisite painting by Jan Bruegel the Elder. Um, it's a harbor scene showing um, St. Paul um, in um, the uh, preaching and um, uh, uh, just some, some highly refined paintings. Um, the Dutch, the Dutch highlights um, are this painting um, here by, it's by uh, uh, Jan Lievens. Uh, it was thought to be by Rembrandt at the time um, and is no longer um, considered uh, an authentic work by Rembrandt. You can see how different the palette is, but um, a really, really great painting by Lievens, um, one of his, his um, followers. And um, a painting by Jan Steen that is exceptionally important. Uh, the, the Copley is the great standout in the American collection. Um, and here's the lone modern um, painting right there, the, the, the um, dance of the elements. So uh, Spanish, Italian, you can see how um, it pretty uh, how panoramic the collection was. It, it, it enabled the um, museum to be able to present a survey of um, European and American painting. And then uh, the, lead, the director of the museum um, has a, a very um, a, a large agenda over the next three years. Uh, first of all, the crest gift had not come in yet. Uh, and so um, he had to work with the Crest Foundation to uh, make that happen. Um, but during this period, a number of gifts came in from North Carolinians and um, collectors and philanthropists uh, in New York. And, um, and this was due to the, um, the really great energy of the North Carolina State Art Society leaders. Uh, but also to Valentiner's close um, and, and deep um, contacts with scholars, dealers, collectors all over the world. Here's the, um, what the uh, first floor looked like when the museum opened over here on the right. Um, these are two in, in ancient uh, sculptures. Bacchus is back there. Um, they were, and this is Hercules, um, Roman sculptures that were donated. Um, and this sculpture of Hercules was, uh, did not have a fig leaf and apparently offended some people. And the day after the museum opened, it was um, taken down, put it into storage until a fig leaf could be prepared. And um, the replica of uh, Antonio Canova's sculpture of George Washington that belonged to the History Museum. Um, the, the original sculpture had burned in the original State House of North Carolina in the early um, 19th century, but the, the replica, um, this plaster replica, um, which belongs to the History Museum, was lent to the museum. And so this um, was the replacement for Hercules for a while. Um, I love this photograph. Uh, some of the gifts, the important gifts that came in were um, a couple from Connecticut, the um, Fred and Florence Olson. They, um, he was the head of a chemical company that had um, uh, over, they um, ran a paper um, uh, production company in, or a paper um, company in, that had a base in Brevard. 
uh, met the uh, director and um, decided that he and that they would together um, give a, a number of objects from their collection. They were the first owners of Jackson Pollock's Blue Poles, um, now in the National Gallery of Australia, one of the most famous um, uh, modern works, um, a really exceptional painting. And so they were, they had a very um, a broad collection, but they ended up giving um, antiquities and um, uh, some African um, and oceanic art. And uh, the when that gift came in, the museum opened five new galleries dedicated to sculpture. And here are some of their gifts. And um, at the same time, Valentiner decided that he needed to initiate a collection of, um, of then contemporary art. And so he gave a number of works by artists, um, contemporary artists, from um, he acquired them and then and handed them over to the museum. And this led to some gifts by other collectors of modern art, including the um, this great painting by Feininger, um, the Green Bridge um, that was given by the um, wife of the art dealer Ferdinand Moller. Um, Peggy Guggenheim gave this painting by Jean Elion, and then um, this great Franz um, Klein that was given by um, the uh, collectors from St. Louis, whom Valentino knew from his days in the Midwest. He organizes um, in the first year a major Rembrandt exhibition, and um, this is when the docents came on board at this museum. Um, for the Rembrandt exhibition. And this, by the way, made international headlines. And um, the next year he organized a, a, a large exhibition of works by Ernst Kirchner. And this was a, um, a outstanding exhibition of works that we could we could not even dream of, we could not even borrow um, many of the works that were in this exhibition. And it's just extraordinarily um, interesting that this exhibition um, and the Rembrandt, all of this really um, gave great, um, uh, really put a celebratory light on the state of North Carolina. And um, Valentina establishes a scholarly journal in 1957, and um, more gifts come in. And this is all leading up to this period. Uh, this is all during this period when um, the Crest Foundation was deciding what it would end up giving to North Carolina. And they eventually, um, I'm gonna fast forward to the Crest collection um, and then close with that. Um, and by the way, uh, please send your questions in the chat I if you haven't already, and I will answer them in a few minutes. The Crest Collection is um, finally announced in 1960. And um, it ends up being a really um, much larger collection than had initially been promised. And um, this is thanks largely to Valentiner, who um, with um, Edwin Gill and the, the, leader, the Art Society leadership, including Robert L. Humber, um, convinced the Crest Foundation to make a much more significant gift. And um, the collection is unveiled and I'm gonna actually close this um, segment by showing you a video that, that, um, that gives an overview of that collection. Um, but but the, the, what ends up um, coming to North Carolina and being unveiled in November of 1960 is 61 Italian paintings, um, actually um, 
61 um, Italian works of art. There were two um, sculptures in that. And then um, 10 uh, Northern European paintings. Uh, all Some of these um, highlights of the museum's collection. And finally, um, when the collection um, um, is appraised at that uh, point, it was appraised at two and a half, the, this is the Crest Collection alone. The Crest Collection alone in 1960 was appraised at $2.5 million. And um, so um, instead of getting a million dollars cash in 19, um, in the late 1940s, early 1950s, um, the North Carolina Museum of Art receives a collection that is worth millions and millions and really is, its value is incalculable because, um, uh, uh, especially because it, uh, within this collection was um, a painting of complete altarpiece by Giotto, uh, the great Florentine artist um, uh, of the early 14th century. And um, a, a work that is uh, the only complete Giotto altarpiece outside of Europe and um, a very important early um, altarpiece by Giotto. So I'm gonna play this and um, it's going to run for a couple of minutes and then I invite your questions. Okay. And there's no music, by the way. The, this is the Botticelli Tondo that was part of the crest gift, um, uh, painted around 1500, um, very nice painting. Um, I think I just got um, myself out of that video. This was the Crest store on, um, down in downtown Raleigh, by the way. Uh, there was not a, a major Crest store in Raleigh um, during the period when so many were founded in North Carolina, um, including Greensboro um, and Asheville and Durham and Salisbury. Um, those were, were your kind of classic um, Crest Art Deco buildings. Um, Raleigh was a uh, latecomer and, and the store was actually founded when um, probably because that gift had been promised. Um, this is the Cress's apartment and um, in New York City, which was covered from um, uh, ceiling to floor with um, Italian art. And uh, also he designed this, this apartment um, to look like a Venetian palazzo on the interior. And um, I, I've highlighted some of the works that ended up being um, presented to North Carolina. That's a painting by Veronese. Um, this is a follower of Giotto, um, a, a really phenomenal altarpiece by Domenichino. Um, 
the the highlight of the European what is this painting by um, Terbruchen. Uh, and um, this is the backside of the museum on uh, uh, the day that the collection arrived. The collection was installed on the first floor of the museum. Uh, they had to rearrange everything when the gift came in because all of the crest paintings were um, monument, or many of them were monumental Baroque paintings. Um, so there's the Batoni being installed by Crest preparators and um, North Carolina preparators. And um, this, by the way, is one of the great paint, one of the greatest paintings, um, in Italian paintings in America, that um, altarpiece by Domenichino. This is Humber here, and this is um, the head of the Crest um, Foundation, um, or the, the chief administrator. Um, and there's Humber with the Giotto, uh, which ended up really um, surprising the world when that came to North Carolina. And this is docent Mar Margaret Steed, who very kindly allowed us to use her uh, um, a photograph that was taken in the fall. Um, and that is the end of that story. Um, so I look forward to uh, being able to, at some point, um, I hope to tell the next chapter of this history. Does so, anyone have any questions? Yes, so uh, we have quite a few and I've assembled them. Okay. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with the first one. Uh, okay. Joel Dixon asked, from where did Mr. Humber move uh, to North Carolina? Oh, um, thank you. I'm glad you asked. Uh, he moved from Paris, actually. He's, he's a lawyer from Greenville, but he had, had been living in Paris, uh, I think, since the 20s. So uh, he and his wife decided to move back to the United States. Um, no accident that it was 1940. And, um, and that's where he, um, so he had, he had uh, been, been visiting museums during his years in Europe and um, really was inspired by uh, the Louvre and uh, institutions like that. So, he decided um, when he moved back to, the, to, he ended up moving um, back to North Carolina and joined the Art Society that he needed to, uh, we needed to have something um, that could inspire this, this pride in, in our state. Next question. Okay. Um, and then Liz, Liz, or Liz says, uh, does any documentation reference the fire destroying the Canova George Washington? in terms of the insistence on a fireproof facility? You mean, um, <laughs> uh, was, is there any connection between the loss of the Canova and the Capitol and the fact that they were um, so insistent on the fireproof building? You know, and, and is there documentation of that? You know, I haven't read um, uh, that explicitly stated, but I am certain that, that there was a connection. And it's funny because it, it's, it's an all, every time they talk about a museum, they talk about a fireproof building in the, um, in the 1940s. Well, actually the 20s, 30s and 40s. Okay. Um, yes, right. next. And, and we have a question from Tiara Paris. Were people of color allowed to be part of the State Art Society? Um, oh God. Uh, hi, Tiara. It's so nice to, um, to have you here. Um, I do not know the answer to that. I have not read that, it, that, um, that there was um, a prescription um, against that. But um, I know, you know, this is the Jim Crow era. So, um, but I haven't read any, um, I haven't read any thing suggesting that there was um, a, a explicit ban. Um, so that's, that's all I can say. Um, I 
really um, doubt that there was uh, a African American um, members um, on that in that group at that time, given the um, the social and um, legal and economic climate and and um, situation. And she also asks, uh, how did the founding uh, collecting principles, an example focusing on old masters, shape the collecting practices of the museum throughout the remainder of the 20th century? Um, okay, wait, I need to go back to your the other question first, um, because Tara, I just thought of something, which is that um, one thing that I th that I learned um, when I, so I was doing research, um, trying to to identify the people in the photographs who were handling art. And I learned that, um, and I ended up talking to uh, an art handler who was, he started working for the NCMA in 1961 or two. Um, and he, um, our, Tom Vinton, our um, long standing art handler, put me in touch with him. And so he told me that um, there were no African Americans um, on the staff except for the, um, the elevator operator. Um, who was a woman um, who I've, um, I've seen her photograph in the newspaper and I don't um, know her name yet, but, but um, there were not Amer African Americans on the um, staff except for that position until the, it might've been the 1970s. So um, uh, that, that tells you a lot. Um, Okay, and so the, the second part of your question is how did, can you tell me, um, rephrase yes, that? Yes, it's Let's how did again. the founding collecting principles, an example focusing on old masters, shape the, co the collecting practices of the museum through the remainder of the 20th century? Um, I, I, it, I, well, actually, the, 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 it, it really shaped the collecting practices in that, um, because because there were lacunae, uh, the, the leadership um, uh, began addressing or redressing that immediately. And so um, all of these um, really efforts were made to, to uh, acquire works in other areas in the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s. So you end up seeing um, in the 1960s, our second director, Eustace Speer, um, who was another German-born um, art historian, um, he um, ended up, he, he made some significant purchases and including sculpture because we hadn't acquired any sculpture. Also, Valentiner, um, at the, after the museum opened in 1956, um, the, two weeks after the museum opened in April, he sent a letter to Humber, who was the head of the state um, that you know the head of the state art commission at that point, and um, and Gill and all the members of the um, the board of directors and said, you have made um, you have a great collection and and I think it's something to be proud of. But you need to acquire sculpture. This is you cannot have an art museum without sculpture. It's really um, um, the primary media and um, uh, some of the greatest achievements were in sculpture. He says, um, it's, there's so many things that he said that ended up really um, kind of forecasting what would happen. But one thing he said in that letter is um, that um, the greatest impressionists, for example, so they hadn't bought any impressionist paintings. Um, he said, but um, you need some impressionist paintings, but um, Rodin is the greatest impressionist artist. So um, I, you need to, to buy some sculpture um, um, by um, Rodin. And, and then he had, had a list of artists that they needed to um, acquire. And um, so he listed these American um, modernists and there's a list um, of names and he, he uh, mentions um, Edith Halpern's gallery in New York. Um, as a place those could be acquired. And then the other thing is that I wanna say, um, which is that he, in this letter, he says um, that he envisions having a sculpture, a, a museum of sculpture to go alongside the museum of paintings. And, um, 
you know, that, that collection was crammed into this old um, state highway building on Morgan Street, but they, um, they, he drew up along with his deputy director Burns, he drew up um, a design for moving the front of the, that building, which is, it faces Morgan Street to Newburn Place on the other side um, and um, designing a modernist facade um, with glass bricks, very cool, and then um, a sculpture garden. And at that, you know, the Museum of Modern Art Garden of Sculpture was only established in 1953. So he said this would be this, you know, really um, uh, novel idea. And then, you know, we ended up with this really um, huge sculpture park in the end, you know, many, many years later. So um, I think that that um answer some of your your question and more <laughs> okay next uh lynn coonan wants to know um does the art society still exist mm. oh great question um a, a form of the art society does exist but um what ended up happening is in 1961 the state decided, well, the State Art Society actually held all of the assets. And this is something that I didn't realize until I began working on this. So even though the collection is part of the North Carolina Museum of Art, the State Art Society, which was a private um, um, entity, although it was under, had, um, was under control of state government and its funds were placed in a treasury um, fund. But then, anyway, they held the assets. So in 1961, um, it was Valentiner and others were not comfortable with that arrangement. Um, so all of those, most of the assets were transferred to the state in 1961. Um, but, and the State Art Society was very unhappy about that. It was, um, made a lot of people very unhappy. And, um, but the, but, um, it became, um, a, um, eventually was subsumed or turned in, into the North Carolina, um, Museum of Art Foundation, which is our, um, our, uh, private foundation, um, kind of co- um, uh, institution that is still um, a central, a really critical um, part of this museum structure. Um, so I, the, the, but there is a group that is, um, that is still um, exists and I, I cannot remember the name, um, but um, it is, there are no members that are, that are um, of that original, um, group of founders um, obviously still alive, but there are people um, uh, um, who's, uh, who were some who were um, familiar with and knew um, the runnings of that, of that group. And um, so it was, um, uh, ended up being kind of turning into the board of director or the, uh, the board of trustees is what the art society, once the assets were transferred in 61, the board of directors really um, was trans, the board, the art society was transformed into the um, board of trustees. Okay, um, that Great. was a concluded answer, but thank you, Lynn. <laughs> and uh, we also got a question from Carolyn Cooper, uh, who is commenting that uh, you provided fascinating information and is wondering if you've considered writing a book. Um, uh, thank you. I appreciate your um, saying that I, and asking that. Um, I have actually, and I, I, I gave a lecture last year in the galleries and some members of the China Historical Association um, attended and they um, were encouraging me to, um, to talk to um, UNC Press about a book. Now, um, I, don't, I don't know, uh, I, you know, it, it could be, it's a really great story um, and I will, would do this and, and um, if I, um, at some point, uh, once I don't have a lot of um, 
institutional priorities uh, that are that need addressing now. <laughs> but um, you know, I it's it's a, it is a story that um, has been told. In, um, the, and I have to, to cite um, a um, woman who wrote a really great history of arts in North Carolina. Um, it, her name is Ola May Fouché. And this is um, a great, it's an interesting book, but she, she does um, tell some of this story and, um, but she didn't get to tell all of it. So I don't know. And we have uh, Megan West asking, when did the NCMA acquire the building they have today? Okay, so that was in um, the, the, the building. We now have a campus with two buildings. Um, the one building uh, was 1980. Um, it was built in 81 and 82 and um, opened in 83. And then the second building was built in um, and opened in 2010. And um, that the, the reason for the um, moving out of downtown um, in the early 1980s, well, they ran out of space. Uh, Valentiner talks about it in his correspondence. Um, they were already out of space um, at the end of the in 19, um, in, the, in the late 50s. So they began, um, uh, trying to build interest and um, support for moving to getting a, a larger um, building. And um, that was a whole other um, controversy that, that, um, that uh, kind of um, unfolded in the 1960s and 70s. They hired Edward Durrell Stone, um, the architect who built the House of the Legislature in, that opened in 1962 um, on Jones Street, um, that building that looks like Kennedy Center because he designed Kennedy Center as well. So they hired um, Stone to design the museum. Um, they, they acquired this land out in Blue Ridge and, um, and they didn't have enough money to build what he designed. So they ended up um, um, reducing it a great, um, deal and that's what ended up being built by the way so it's not the original design but um, but it, you can see the the very um, it's it's of a period uh, and it's um, a, this really um, modernist brutalist style um, and you see features in it um, that that um, were common in the the 60s and, and um, 70s. Okay, um, thank you for that question. And uh, we have a great question from Ken Snyder. Is the Hercules uh, fig leaf still in place or are we more enlightened about what art is today? <laughs> okay, <laughs> so this is, I'm glad you asked about that because um, they put Hercules in a closet on the third floor and the um, deputy director, James Burns, um, he, who came with Valentina, he had been Valentina's um, uh, colleague in Los Angeles. Um, he was also an artist, so he made the fig leaf and, um, and they added it and, the, and Hercules went back up uh, in 1958. So it took two years, but um, the, I, I, I don't think the fig leaf um, still exists. And, um, but it was of course um, removed again. But um, when Valentina, who had been, he had been, um, he started out at the, um, the Kaiser Friedrich Museum in Berlin in the early 20th century. Then he was the first curator of basically medieval art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, in, uh, 1908 to 14, and then he went back to Europe, um, fought in the First World War, and then moved to Detroit. So he was, uh, I mean, he was, and he was on really the kind of cutting edge of art um, uh, museum development and collecting. But anyway, um, he wrote a, he wrote memoirs and kept diaries and um, and some, some of those were published in a biography of Valentina and he writes, so it's published, that he says, he comments, um, 
when I came to the Metropolitan um, Museum of Art, um, um, it, it took a while to remove ashtrays. Um, and um, and I, I ended up, um, you know, it, it seemed like um, a really backwards at the time. But then I moved to Raleigh in 1956. And, um, I, and oh, and they were removing things beliefs at the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, when he was there. Well, in 1950s in Raleigh, they're putting them back on. So he was really um, disappointed, but uh, the, the, it was uh, felt that the, the, the uh, public was not ready for that kind of nudity. Um, and uh, we have just three more questions left. Uh, Lynn Coonan also wants to know when the Rodans came to the museum. Oh, thank you. That was in um, 2009. And um, the David Steele uh, organized an exhibition of Rodin sculpture. And so they borrowed um, these bronze casts from the Rodin Foundation. And, um, and it was a very successful and Larry, can, um, Larry Wheeler, the director um, up until 2018. So he um, developed a friendship with, uh, with Iris Cantor um, and um, the um, Dwayne of the, um, the, that family. Um, and she and, and uh, ended up deciding that she would make a large gift to the North Carolina Museum of Art. Um, but we had to get a building, um, a new building in order to just to house that collection. And so that's what led to the creation of the building, the 2010 building um, that um, is the, the building um, that is now where our uh, collection is housed. Um, so that was that was how that building ended up really getting built was through the receipt of that gift. And actually, we just have one question left. Uh, was the lower number of Italian paintings acquired with funds due to the anticipated Cressus gift? Yes, yes, it was. Um, thank you. And and you know what was surprising about that is they even though they knew that they were going to be getting. Um, a collection of mostly Italian art. They still bought um, some. They still bought Italian paintings and and um, ended up getting uh, two of the the really um, most important Italian paintings in the collection are these views of Dresden by uh, Bernardino Bellotto, the 18th century Venetian painter. Um, the um, really really magnificent um, two views of Dresden taken on either side of the Alp. And those were um, were among their um, original purchases. And um, they bought them, I think, for $10,000 each. And now they're, um, I think we just, one of them is probably worth about um, $16 million alone, so. Um, thank you so much for those questions.